welcome you all again. Uh, today, this is the last talk of uh, this series uh, titled of Astrophysical Talk, uh, organized by Istanbul University Observatory. And today, our speaker is uh, Simon Portuguese Watt from uh, Leiden University. Uh, and he will give us a talk titled The Origin and Evolution of the Earth Cloud. So uh, thanks for uh, having you here. So you can start sharing your screen. I will do that. <clears throat> thanks, uh, Khan, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, it's it's it, 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 it would have been nice to be uh, in Istanbul right now. Um, I, uh, I have been there uh, a few times, but never visited the uh, observatory, uh, regretfully. The first time I was in Istanbul was when I was uh, eight years old, and I traveled with my father, and I, uh, I was very deeply impressed by uh, the complete difference of culture in, uh, in Turkey and in Istanbul compared to what I was used to in, in the West and in the Netherlands. I really loved the uh, stalactites, the, 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 uh, the, the, the mosques, uh, the Blue Mosque and uh, the Hagia Sophia and uh, the Galata Tower. And I even went to a dinner with my father to the Galata Tower and it was a belly dancer um, who made a picture of me with her. Um, and I tried to find the picture to show you, but um, it was too short time to, uh, to get around to find that picture. But it was uh, it was very impressive, and uh, later I went back several times, but never to the observatory. Now I'm here virtually, at least, and I will talk about uh, 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 the, the the something that I I worked on on the Oort cloud uh, in the last few years, and it it it, it started it, it started by, um, you know, if you think about the Oort cloud, it is an extremely curious sort of part of the solar system which is on the edge of the outside or of the inside. NASA calls it the outside. I would say as an astrophysicist, I would call it part of the solar system because it's in the Hill sphere. It's in the, the uh, potential of the sun, uh, objects that orbit the sun in the galactic, uh, the global galactic potential. Um, and I think the fantastic thing of the Oort cloud is in particular for theorists, um, uh, we, we hardly know anything about it. And uh, and there are not that many people really working on it uh, still today. Um, so that makes it for theorists an, an ideal object. Uh, consider that the Oort cloud may be populated by something like 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 14 comets or whatever objects that are there. And we see about one a year. Um, then you can imagine that that you know if you have one in 10 to the 14, if you take all the classical music ever made by humans and you only hear you know a few tones and you immediately can reconstruct uh either Bach or uh, or Beethoven or or any other classical composer or heavy metal uh, uh queen um, and you have to reconstruct those songs from these few tones you hear you can imagine how little we really know of the earth cloud even though we think we know not a lot about it and it, it all started with uh, this young fellow, if you see here the picture, which was at the time uh, uh, in, in, in Leiden. And uh, Jan Hendrik Oort uh, considered the Oort cloud. Here you see, uh, by the way, uh, a picture on the left side uh, of uh, Neowise, the comet that visited uh, uh, Earth uh, recently. Um, and in the orbital elements are, are an eccentricity, very elliptic orbit and an extremely wide orbit. So this is a typical very wide Oort cloud type of comet that visits the Earth once in a while. So this is one of these musical tones that we have in order to study the composition of the Oort cloud. Now the work here, which I, I will present a little bit about, um, is, is something that I did together with Anthony Brown, uh, who is a, a researcher mostly working on Gaia in Leiden. Maxwell Tsai, who is currently a, a, a software developer in, in Microsoft. Uh, Santiago Torres is a postdoc uh, in uh, UCLA. And uh, Anthony Pelopesi is a, a software engineer at the eSign Center in, uh, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And the reason to study this is that, that you know, I started almost doubting of the existence of the Oort cloud based on these few comments we have. Uh, and I thought, well, the only reason really to understand what's going on is by trying to really 
uh, find out what, what could have caused the formation of the Oort cloud and how does it evolve. Um, and as I said before, it's, it's not an extremely popular topic among astronomers, even though there are many astronomers who spent their entire career on the Oort cloud. Um, it, it, it's not like cosmology or so, where there are thousands of astronomers working on it. It's only uh, a relatively limited number. So the best way to figure out if something, if you believe something, is by going back to Oort's paper, of which you see here the uh, the first page or part of the first page. And you know, if I'm honest, not much has changed since then. And and the reason is probably that you know there are no observations apart from comets. Uh, of anything in the Oort cloud. And, and that will change probably with uh, the Vera Rubin telescope, uh, LSST, um, uh, the James Webb telescope, whatever big observations will be done. Uh, and then maybe we can see real Oort cloud objects rather than sort of the leftovers that are thrown to us by, uh, by the tidal field or by passing stars. So what Oort writes here, in 1950, is uh, it is between 50,000 and 150,000 AU from the sun. I think that you know the numbers have changed a little bit. Maybe I would say now 10,000 to 200,000 AU, but it's you know it's still ballpark. Uh, it's right here, 10 to 11 comets. I think the number went up a little bit, you know, by factor 100, which you know for this sort of estimate on basically no direct observations is uh, is, is is very interesting. And uh, the uh, the total mass, one tenth to one hundredth of that of the Earth, also you know didn't really change that much. And uh, I, I think it's extremely impressive that that you can do such a paper. I mean, if you want to have an example of students how to write a paper um, in astrophysics um, of an uncertain topic, then this uh, this may be a very good example. Everybody should read, I think, uh, Orr's uh, 1950 paper in that respect. Now, one of the first pictures of, uh, of, of uh, a comet, actually, of the comet Halley, in this case, comes uh, from, uh, from Turkey. And uh, this is a picture, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where it is. Um, it may be in the Topkapi Palace, but uh, you probably know better than, than I do. Well, I'm sure you do. Uh, but this is a very early uh, depiction of, uh, of a comet of an Oort cloud visitor from, uh, from, from Turkey. Now, if you look at what uh, Oort wrote about the Oort cloud and what we now think sort of the Oort cloud is composed of, you have the sun in the middle in this picture. Then you have sort of a flat system uh, extending about maybe 40 AU, which is the circumstellar disk, which contains the planets, the asteroids, um, the moons. Um, and then there is a sort of a dearth of stuff between, let's say, 50 AU and uh, and maybe 10,000 AU, and then you get sort of a spherical distribution, according to Oort, um, of uh, asteroids of 10 to the 11, maybe 10 to the 14, uh, asteroid type object, which contains CO ice. And therefore, if they get close to the sun, they develop a tail, and uh, we see them as a comet if they, uh, they get close to the sun. So it's a very curious sort of shell, right? I mean, it's like a shell around the solar system at an outer edge of maybe 100, 200 AU, and an inner edge of something like 10,000, maybe a few thousand AU. So how do you get that? And if you if you think about it, how you get it, uh, it's, it's non-trivial. So I uh, perform simulations as I'm a mostly computationally oriented astrophysicist. And the simulations will be done with the uh, astrophysical multipurpose software environment. And for short, we call it AMUS. And AMUS is a, is a nice, basically, Sort of a do-all package. It's a it's a software package we wrote over the last decades, where we use code, existing code from other people, to solve radiative transfer, stellar dynamics, hydrodynamics, stellar evolution, and and many other things. But those are the four main ingredients. And for each of these ingredients, stellar dynamics and radiative transfer, there are at least two codes that can solve for that particular physics. So you can compare and you can swap one code for the other code, redo your calculation, and then validate for yourself whether or not you think this is a viable calculation or not, or maybe you have to implement another code. For gravitational dynamics, for example, there are 12 codes uh, that, that can solve your gravity problem. And stellar evolution, there are, you know, I don't know, seven codes or eight codes which do stellar evolution. Um, but the magic of a muse is not particularly that you can address these codes all by using the same sort of interface. 
but it is really that you combine the results of these codes and build up a more complex, more rewarding type of simulation with multi-physics and multi-scale, where you have multi-scale in stellar dynamics, multi-physics combining it by stellar evolution, hydrodynamics, and radiative transfer. You can imagine if you do a star cluster simulation, you would like to incorporate the stellar evolution. You want to have the winds. Maybe you want to have the interaction with the rest of the galaxy. You want to put in the radiative transfer. Now, if we study the Oort clouds, uh, what we need is, is also sort of a multi-scale, multi-physics environment. You need the sun was probably born in a clustered environment. So you need the star cluster for the early evolution, the evolution of the star, maybe some hydrodynamics for the gas, the tidal field of the galaxy, which caused the cluster to evaporate. But then you have also the planets in orbit around the sun. So you need a separate solver for doing the planetary dynamics, which is a different solver than for which you do the cluster dynamics, which is a completely, it's the same physics, but it's a completely different scale. And then you have the asteroids in the solar system. So the debris disk, so to say, which is scattered around by the giant planets. And uh, you want to solve those, maybe not by integrating the full n squared type of dynamical evolution, but by maybe doing test particle integration. So you want to combine a test particle integrator with an integrator for doing the planetary dynamics and combine that with an integrator for doing the star cluster. And that you would like to put in the galactic tidal field because that's important too. And then add stellar evolution. And maybe, you know, for the fun, some hydrodynamics. So you get a very complex numerical framework. And with AMUs, this is possible to do that. And it's even relatively straightforward to, uh, to set up a code that combines all these different ingredients into a homologous and homogeneous uh, simulation environment with which you can do your calculation. Well, the next step, of course, is to find a computer in which you can run this all. And then you run it and you analyze the data. And that's sort of what I will present here in this talk. So Amuse is uh, basically you write in Python, that's the top layer here on the left side. In a level below that, it's a more technical part is the manager and the manager deals with units. So you can work in astrophysical units like we love and, 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 and like. Um, and the reason is that, that astrophysical codes generally are in aero dimensionless units or in funny units, depending on the author. With an Amuse, you can do everything in CGS or in solar masses and, and, and AU or Parsec, whatever you like. All the unit conversion is done automatically. And we, we log logically organize things in, in terms of particles. Below that, you have the community modules, which is gravitational dynamics, hydrodynamics, stellar evolution, radiative transfer. And these are all the interfaces. And then there is a sort of a magic going on, which is we call the parent proxy pair, which uses the message passing interface, which is a standard uh, parallel operation protocol um, in order to connect to the compiled codes, which are written in C or Fortran or Java or Haskell or uh, Ruby or uh, Julia, whatever is your preference. Can even be in Python if you like. Uh, but these codes are supposedly high performance and most of the time should be spent or will be spent or is spent in those codes. And what is spent in the top layer, which is only the organizational layer, which is in Python, is only a very small part, which makes the code high performance, automatically parallel, uh, using GPUs um, if you have them available and if the code is, uh, is suitable for that. So this is the framework I use to, um, to perform the calculations on your cloud, as I will explain. There are about 60 codes in the Muse, a little bit more. Uh, in the stellar evolution part, there are codes like MESA, uh, GENEC, uh, the, the Geneva stellar evolution codes, SIBA, parametrized stellar evolution codes. For stellar dynamics, there are codes like PTAR, which is a high precision uh, embody code, PH4, Brutus, all kinds of embody codes, tree codes are available. For hydrodynamics, there is uh, Gadget or Flash and uh, AMR VAC uh, and several other codes. And for radius transfer, uh, simplex, SPH ray, uh, and, and several other alternatives. There are uh, more than 100 people using Amuse. We had a summer school in Geneva uh, two weeks ago, which was very nice with young students and, and professors sitting in the audience wanting to learn how to use the package in order to perform their own simulations. And um, we helped them to do that. Now, this is an example of an Amuse script. Um, 
And if you're if you're Python, uh, if you have a program in Python, you sort of uh, recognize the first sentence for sure. From amuse.lab import star. According to uh, some of my colleagues, you shouldn't do that, but it's, you know it's bloody handy. Um, and in this case, it's just shorter. Then I make a solar system. There is a routine to initialize a, a solar system. You can put a time here if you want a certain solar system at a certain date. It takes the ephemerates and it, uh, it gives you the positions and velocities of all the particles in the solar system, uh, as far as known. Uh, you put it at a certain position, let's say at 8.5 kiloparsec in the x direction, which puts it in a sort of a galactic uh, system. You give it a velocity of, let's say, 220 kilometers per second. So it's moving around in the galactic potential. Um, you add asteroids to the system. Maybe you want to add an extra number of asteroids, maybe a million asteroids in the plane of the, of the, if the ecliptic around the solar system. And then you start the integrator. So the integrator will have the planets. In this case, it's a Hermite integrator. We call it gravity. And in this case, we have a test particle integrator for the asteroids because you don't want to do the n squared operations of the gravity calculation on your million asteroids because that would slow down your code horribly. So you use a test particle integrate, which means that the asteroids are just floating around on the potential of the star and the planets. Maybe you want to add a galactic model, like we put it in a galactic orbit anyway. So let's put in a galactic model. And then the big magic is in this bridge. A bridge is something that is a, a way to integrate one code with respect to the other code. It's like a leapfrog integrator, but not by solving differential equations, but by really solving, well, the differential equations in this case are codes, which in themselves solve differential equations. But bridge is a method uh, designed originally by Michiko Fuji, uh, who is now a professor in the Tokyo University, but she was a postdoc with me in Leiden when uh, we worked on this uh, bridge uh, implementation in Amuse. And then you add the test particle integrator, which uses the gravity integrator and the galaxy integrator, but itself, it's not doing any operations on the, it doesn't affect the gravity and it doesn't affect the galaxy. And it doesn't affect the solar system. It doesn't affect the, the galactic potential. And then you have an event loop. You run it for, let's say a, a giga year. You say code, which is this bridge coupled code environment evolve for 1 million years, and then maybe you want to put some output. You want to have some diagnostics to see what's going on. And then you run this until it's done, and then you study the data. It's basically what I, what I did in this uh, little project. Now, if you want to know about Amuse, uh, Steve McMillan and I wrote a book about it, uh, which you can download from the IOP website. It should be free if you download it from your university domain. And if you buy a hard copy, it's like 25 euros in uh, black and white. Uh, and it will send to you, it will be printed on demand. And a new version of the book is expected to be coming out uh, somewhere next year. And then we have uh, two co-authors uh, we add to that, which is Inti Pelepesi and uh, Stephen Reeder, who are now also working on, uh, on the book and on Amuse. We also have a spin-off, which is called Omuse, for which we uh, contacted uh, um, uh, Henk Dijkstra. Henk Dijkstra is a professor in Utrecht University working on oceanic flows and uh, oceanography on the Earth. Um, you see a picture on the right side where he studies uh, the climate and the atmosphere on the, on the Earth. And we couple all these codes which they use for oceanography in, uh, in, in the OMUSE environment. It's basically it's the same as, as AMUSE, except that the codes are dedicated for doing atmosphere and oceans and ice sheets on planetary surfaces. Um, so you can couple it to AMUSE. Well, it is automatically coupled to AMUSE. So you can do your planet integration in an orbit around uh, the sun, for example, or around any other star, and study exoplanets' uh, atmospheres in that way. But this we only used in order to do the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere at the moment. Now back to the Oort cloud. So this is the numerical environment. And what I will do is uh, I will try to understand how you get the Oort cloud. What is the formation mechanism and what is the sustainability, what is the lifetime of the Oort cloud? And uh, the, the way to start that is by uh, taking um, uh, the solar system. And I, I give here as an example, only uh, the outer planets, which you see here on the, on the left side. Um, and you see here the blue curve is uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And I have a little asteroid in orbit around um, the sun near or between Jupiter and Saturn. And it's not one asteroid, this is just singling out one asteroid, but I really have a disk of asteroids in the solar system, a million asteroids. 
including the planets and integrate that in time. And what you see happening is sort of the following. And let me, let me show you a movie, which is always a bit tricky, uh, but I can do that. So what you see here is a function of time, is how this asteroid is bullied around by Jupiter and Saturn. And then it's kicked in a more elongated orbit. But you see that the pericenter distance to the Jupiter and Saturn stays more or less the same. So the change of the orbit is mostly driven by interactions with the planets. And once it's kicked in one direction, it will continue interacting with the giant planets and be kicked further and further out into eventually the Oort cloud. Now here you see it reached 10,000 AU, 12,000 AU, and uh, it will return and then it will be kicked again until at some point it is so far away that it either escapes so the asteroid will come here. This is how the movie stops. And this is basically where the line you see here. So this is the early phase where the asteroid is being bullied around on a short time scale in about 0.1 million years. It leaves the inner planets and even the outer planets, right? Uranus and Neptune is about here. So the Kuiper belt is, is a little bit larger than that. So here it's already unperturbed from the inner planets, except when it reaches pericenter and it takes about 0.3 million years. And after about 2 million years, you see it's really approaching the edge of where uh, the tidal field starts perturbing the asteroid. So if the sun is just setting still in the middle of nowhere, the asteroid will probably be ejected eventually. But due to the presence of the tidal field of the galaxy, the asteroid feels a little bit of a drag force or a little bit of a tuck from the potential of the galaxy, causing the orbit of the asteroid to circularize a little bit. And when it gets circular, it will miss the inner part of the solar system. So you can imagine the eccentricity of the orbit here is something like 0.9999, uh, really extremely eccentric orbits. And if you change the orbit a little bit at upper center of its orbit to an eccentricity of 0.9998, for example, it will come back to the solar system, but it will miss any of the planets. And the moment it misses the planets, the planets themselves cannot keep kicking out the asteroids to wider and wider orbits, but it will still be perturbed on the outside. So this is a very natural way in which you can form an Oort cloud object. It will be kicked out from the solar system because of interaction with the planets. At upper center, it will interact with the galactic tidal field until upon return to the inner solar system, it will miss the inner planets. It will not be kicked out anymore and it will only be circularized. So the density profile of objects in the Oort cloud then is determined by basically the last kick the asteroid got from the giant planets before it got circularized, well, not completely circular, but at least circularized to a level that it misses the inner solar system and it cannot be kicked out anymore. That sets the density profile of asteroids in the Oort cloud. So in that case, the Oort cloud will be completely built out of asteroids, which originally were inside the solar system, inside the orbit of Neptune, because Neptune and the other giant planets will drive this, this process. Now the picture then looks as follows. If you see here the, in the diagram on the horizontal axis, we have the semi major axis in log scale, and on the vertical axis, we have eccentricity. Asteroids are born here with three different colors or four different colors, the green, black, red, and yellow. And you see here the black asteroids, which is one of the examples I just gave, is kicked out along what I call here the conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt is the, the belt in semi-major axis and eccentricity in which uh, the pericenter of the asteroid is common with the orbit of the giant planets, causing the giant planets to every time it comes along to kick it in a higher eccentric orbit. So the asteroid will evolve from this black region along this line until it leaves this region where uh, the inner planet, the, 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 the galaxy will start perturbing the orbit. Now, a few things can happen here. And that is either upon the next encounter with one of the giant planets, the asteroid is completely kicked out, leaving the solar system, never to return probably, or it gets kicked into such an eccentric orbit that the tidal field will start circularizing it. You see here the 
three time scales, three arrows, blue arrows, which go down, which if it's kicked out in a very, very extremely wide orbit, almost leaving the hill radius of the sun in the potential of the galaxy, the circularization time scale is less than a million years. And if it's just barely kicked into the Oort cloud, the circularization time scale due to the presence of the um, tidal field of the galaxy is more than 100 million years. So this is sort of the 100 million year circularization time scale boundary. So asteroids are kicked out from the giant planets in a time scale of 10 million years or less. And if the movie I just showed was a 2 million year time scale, but it takes a little bit longer really to reach the Oort cloud. So within 10 million years, it's kicked out in the Oort cloud. And then on a time scale of about 100 million years, it circularizes and populates the Oort cloud. But there is a little problem with this. And that is if the sun was born in a star cluster, then the, it's not the hill radius of the sun in the galactic potential we should take into account, which is calculated using the current orbit of the sun. But if the sun was part of a parental cluster, then the hill radius may have been much smaller, maybe even as big as this one, or maybe even smaller than that because of the neighboring stars and the sun moving around in the cluster. And in that moving around, it's much easier to lose your asteroid. Actually, it is very hard to keep it bound. All the asteroids will basically be lost. So Jupiter and Saturn, which kick out asteroids on a time scale of less than 10 million years, will not be able to make the Oort cloud. They deplete the disk, and the disk particles will become part of the, the galaxy or the star cluster, but they will not be able to stay bound in the solar system and form an Oort cloud because the time scale on which Jupiter and Saturn kick out asteroids is shorter than the lifetime of the star cluster in which the sun was born. And the star cluster in which the sun was born eats away these asteroids. Now these free floating asteroids must remain somewhere. So they populate the galaxy. And it may well be that the galaxy is brimming with all the planetary systems that try to form and try to make Oort clouds, but failed because all the asteroids were kicked out to infinity or somewhere in the galaxy. And now it happened to be in 2007, the first interstellar asteroid visited the solar system. It's called Oumuamua, and Oumuamua passed by the solar system. It flew through, and it may have been such an object that was kicked out by an early planetary system, by a massive planet, in a relatively early phase. So Jupiter and Saturn are not responsible for making the Oort cloud. Now then who is? If you look at the inner solar system, where Earth and Mars and Venus will kick out asteroids, they have no conveyor belt. They cannot kick out asteroids. They're not massive enough to kick out asteroids as violently as Jupiter does. So these asteroids will segregate into the resonance orbits, here indicated with the vertical lines. But Uranus and Net Neptune, sorry, Uranus and Neptune, the outer two giant planets, the ice giants, they do the same thing as Jupiter and Saturn, but on a much longer time scale because they're lower in mass and their orbits are much wider. So it takes much longer for them to kick out asteroids. The efficiency at which Jupiter and Saturn kick out asteroids on a time scale is about 100 million years, which is enough to, for, the system, for the solar system to allow it to leave the parent cluster. So where Jupiter and Saturn cannot kick out asteroids and make it into the Oort clouds, Jupiter and Saturn can. They will kick out asteroids. They will go along to very high eccentricity through this narrow neck and then arrive in the Oort cloud when the sun has left the parent cluster. Now, there is another thing that can happen in uh, the parent cluster, and that is other stars will meet the sun. So sometimes, once in a while, some star will pass the solar system and the sun and the other star will exchange debris from their disks. And I have a little movie of that. Let me, let me try to find that. Um, which I should. Uh, so here you can see how the debris, debris disk of the sun. Oh, this is not the right movie. This is the right movie. You see here uh, the, 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 the solar system and another star, and they have a disk of, in this case, red and blue. And they exchange material. Some material is lost, that is the gray stuff, but the, the green stuff is captured from the other star and the orange stuff is captured by our own sun. There you see it again. 
And on the right side, you see the orbital, you see the same thing in orbital elements. So the, uh, you see how the, the semi X and eccentricity, how the objects are being captured by the solar system. So the orange stuff is the asteroids captured from other stars in the typical type of orbit of, uh, in the solar system. And uh, so these asteroids are captured in this regime, as you saw earlier in the movie. This is the regime where asteroids from other stars can be captured in the parent cluster. They stay around until the sun leaves the parent cluster or they are perturbed by other passing stars, but that will also probably deliver new asteroids. And if they can enter this conveyor belt region where Uranus and Neptune will kick them out into even higher eccentric orbits and they can become part of the Oort cloud. So the Oort cloud then is composed of asteroids which were born around Uranus and Neptune and kicked out by the planets into the Oort cloud eventually or by captured asteroids from uh, other stars in the cluster with which the sun was born. Now here you see that depicted. Uh, here you see the conveyor belt in same major axis and eccentricity again in log units for the horizontal axis. So this is basically a blow up of the previous picture, but with the results of some simulations. The line gives you the conveyor belt for uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And you see the green stuff is the outer edge of the circumstellar disk, assuming that it extended to something like a few hundred AU. And you see how that disk is scattered by passing stars. And you see how the captured asteroids from other stars um, are the brown points. And the little arrows, the little points, point in the direction of how they move in a time scale of uh, a, a few million years. And you see if asteroids are at the edge of the sun, uh, the sun's uh, circumstellar disk, they are perturbed quite heavily. You see that on the long lines. But if they're captured in this regime, they are kicked into the Oort cloud which is indicated with the long lines which go to the right. But if they are in the parking zone, they stick around. They cannot move anymore because they're too far away from uh, the planets and they're too far out for the planets and they're too far in for the galaxy to perturb them. So the solar system has sort of a parking zone where asteroids once populated, once parked, stay there basically indefinitely until the sun becomes a white dwarf or starts losing mass on the AGB, uh, then these orbits will change. And the parking zone is something between 100 and maybe 1,000 AU at an eccentricity of about 0.6 and uh, between 0.2 and 0.8 maybe. And now it happens to be that a few objects were observed in this region, which is Setna. So Setna is exactly in the region where you have the brown points and the green points overlapping. And that means that we don't really know if Setna is an original asteroid that belonged to the solar system or that it was captured by, uh, uh, from another star, that it really belonged to another star. So the idea is that capture was, Setna was captured maybe in the first 100 million years of the evolution of the solar system. So I think we should have a, a, an ast an, 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 an spacecraft going to Setna to investigate what, where it came from. Now here is the schematic picture. This is the solar system. Uh, this is the conveyor belt region between Jupiter and Neptune. Asteroids which are born in this region or even in the disk are kicked out to white uh, orbits where they circularize again. And the hill radius, the outer edge of the Oort cloud will cause asteroids to leaving the solar system. So if an asteroid comes at a distance beyond something like two times 10 to the five AU, 200,000 AU, other stars will start picking it up or the galactic potential will start causing it to drift away from the solar system. This is how an asteroid that is kicked in the Oort cloud region here between 10,000 and something like a few hundred thousand AU circularizes. So it's kicked in an, in an same age as it's kicked at very high eccentricity. And if it's kicked in a relatively narrow orbit, it will take a long time to segregate into low eccentricity. In this case to something like hundred million years. And if it's uh, kicked into a wider orbit here at 10 to the 5 AU, it is more like a random walk over eccentricity at that distance. Once it's parked in that distance, it's hard to change the semi-major axis, but it is relatively easy to change the orbital eccentricity of the asteroid. Now, this is the whole picture again. I will, I will skip that. If you put it in a slightly different uh, plane, this is semi-major axis again, but this is now 
log uh, of one minus the eccentricity. So circular orbits are, uh, are, are at the top here. And these are all eccentric orbits. You see that the uh, conveyor belt then turns into straight lines. So asteroids uh, uh, originally from the solar system were populated in the ecliptic disk to a distance of uh, you know, about 1,000 AU. Uh, asteroids are scattered due to passing stars. They get into this regime. They're kicked by the giant planets into along this, this conveyor belt. And once they reach this delta uh, velocity, the, the, the perturbation of the galaxy of about 0.1%, they start circularizing and populate the circular type of orbits. The contours here in white are the captured asteroids, which are also partly populating the conveyor belt. And they're kicked also into the Oort cloud and circularize, and they end up in this regime. And once in a while, an asteroid from this regime will be kicked into an extremely high wide orbit and then become a comet. So this is the region where asteroids moving from the region where you have the planets along the conveyor belt into the Oort cloud circularizes to you know, point, point 0.1 or point uh, eccentricity or low eccentricity and uh, then maybe kicked into very eccentric orbits where they can visit the inner planets again. So this is the line that crosses the, uh, the Earth. And this is uh, asteroids that, that will hit the solar system, uh, hit, hit the sun itself. So this is the picture. Asteroids are born near the planets. They kicked along the, by the planets along the conveyor belt, reach the Oort cloud, circularize, and that's how we get the Oort cloud. So now we have a model of the Oort cloud. We can start studying all kinds of parameters based on the Oort cloud. We can, for example, look at the eccentricity distribution of the inner disk, the disk after 3 million years, or at the Oort cloud. And the dotted line here, the, 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 the purple line, I'm sorry, the purple line gives you the eccentricity distribution of Oort cloud objects. So if people say the Oort cloud is mostly circular orbits, I don't think that can be correct. I think the eccentricity of the Oort cloud is basically a thermal distribution here indicated with the bluish uh, colored line, which sort of follows the scattered objects. The bump at low eccentricity is caused by the captured asteroids from other stars, which may still be there. And the density profile of the Oort cloud, the inner disk, well, the density profile of r to the minus two, the distance to the sun to the minus two power. But in the Oort cloud, it is much steeper. And there is actually some structure. So you see that the Oort cloud, if you would say the Oort cloud is sort of where you have the dense region, it would be between maybe uh, two, 3,000 AU and maybe 10 to the 5 AU. So that is exactly what, what Oort said, right? Oort said in his original paper, the Oort cloud will be between 10 to 50,000 and 100,000, 150,000 AU. And that's exactly where you find it also if you do the simulations of asteroids born in a circumstellar disk with planets and the planets kick them out into the Oort cloud and they circularize due to the tidal field. You see an interesting tale here of asteroids that are even outside the hill radius. Formally, they are not bound to the sun, but they stick around. Asteroids just don't leave the sun like that because they have a similar velocity as the sun in the galactic potential. So they, they hang around. It's like, you know, having, having uh, students uh, after lecture uh, keep following the professor um, in order to ask questions, right? They're not bound to the professor. The lecture is over, but they still stick around. Now you can see this in, uh, in a galactic view. This is the orbit of the sun in the galactic potential. This is where it was a billion years ago. And the yellow dot here is where it is today. So it orbited over the last billion years. It took uh, several orbits, one, two, three, four. Uh, every 250 million years or so, it has one orbit. And after four orbits and a billion years later, this is where the sun will be. And this is where the asteroids, which were kicked out by Jupiter and Saturn and by uh, Uranus and Neptune are along. So they, they follow as a tidal tail along the orbit of the sun in the galactic potential. And this is in the XY plane. And here you see in the Z plane, you see it's sort of a cloud of asteroids, not only in the hill sphere of the sun, not only the Oort cloud, but also a bunch of unbound asteroids which follow the sun in, the galactic, in its galactic orbit. Here you see a blow up of three by three parsec of the sun with the Oort cloud. The yellow curve here is the outer edge of the Oort cloud. 
Now, if you now do, if you now think that each star in the solar neighborhood, this is a potential of each star from Gaia, dr2. I should now remake this picture with dr3, I guess, of the current location of the sun, which is here in the middle. And what you see here is the potential of the stars in the solar neighborhood. So if you if you draw the the equal potential surfaces, these are the lines here. And the little dimples you see are the individual stars, including their mass. So there's a massive star here or a few stars together, which blend. Now, if each of these stars in the past had uh, planets with a circumstellar disk, you can imagine that each of these stars has kicked out their planets in the same way that the sun has been doing it, or that the giant planets has been kicking out asteroids and making the Oort cloud. Many of the Oort cloud objects will not make it into their particular Oort clouds, but they're also unbound, and they also stick around on the orbit of these stars. Now, using Gaia, we, can, we know the orbits of these stars, so we can calculate it backwards in time and give each of these stars you know, a fake planetary system. We don't know what sort of planetary system they have, at least for most cases. So we can give them a random planetary system using some oligarchic growth model, give them an ecliptic with asteroids and study how the dynamics of the asteroids and planets in the sun, in, their, in that particular star, in the orbit of the galaxy develops. And if you do that, this is the initial conditions of such a calculation. If you calculate the stars back for 1 billion years, so the sun is then here, but all the other stars, which today are the nearest stars of the sun, this is where they are. And they all have their orbits around the galactic potential. And if you do that for a billion years, this is their orbits. So here you see how the stars are orbiting the galaxy and they all end up near the sun today. That is where we observe them using the Gaia satellite. Here you see a few of these asteroids of, of the stars in, in their orbit. This is a binary star, Cygnus B, 61 Cygnus B, I mean, and A. And uh, the red one is the A and the blue one is the lower mass star companion. And the black curve here is the orbit of the sun. And what you see here, the dotted lines is the orbit of the two stars as they orbit the galactic potential in the same time that the sun is orbiting the galactic potential. And the green stuff around it is at a certain number of moments after half a billion years every time, uh, after 200 million years, I mean, uh, where the asteroids are that were kicked out by the hypothetical planets of 61 Cygnus B and A, and the hypothetical asteroids, of course, and where they end up. And you see, it's also like the sun, they form a sort of banana shape around the orbit of the sun. And at the moment of today, you see that the green stuff here, these are the two stars, which are uh, the massive stars, uh, which I pointed out here, right? This is Cygnus, uh, uh, 61 Cygnus B and A. And they are, at the moment, the sun is observed, we observe them, we live today in the sun, there, that's where they are. But the green stuff around it is the asteroids belonging to Cygnus uh, B and E, 61 Cygnus B and E. And you see that the sun is in the tail of these asteroids. So the question is, if we find Oumuamua, as we saw in 2017, could it be coming from Cygnus, uh, the 61 Cygnus binary system? Or could it have come from another star? How many asteroids in the Nibema route of the sun are actually from neighboring stars? Here you see another example of a star, HD 103095. It has a very eccentric orbit and it's, uh, it's born here. And you see on its first orbit, it basically already loses uh, part of its, of its asteroid. And after a billion years, it's, it, there are no asteroids bound. It has no Oort cloud, but all the asteroids which were kicked out by the planets are in this banana shape of its orbit. And we are in that same shape. We are in the banana uh, asteroid tidal tail of, um, of HD 103095. Now you can do that for all the 100 stars or so in the solar neighborhood. Well, let me show that. I can show that in a movie. Um, I can show it in a movie. Uh, and this is how it looks like. So you, this, let, me, let me start the movie at the beginning. 
This is the initial conditions, which I showed before. You see the positions of the stars, the orbit. This is just for guiding the eye. I put in the burst position of the sun and I put in the current position of the sun. You see here how each of these stars have a little Oort cloud. You, see, you don't see that here because the scale is so large that they're all inside the little dots. But you see here in the Z plane, which is only 100 by 100 parsec, uh, that they all have little banana uh, Oort clouds already. And if they evolve in time, you see how the Oort clouds develop. They, they all form little Oort clouds at this point because the asteroids are kicked out by the hypothetical planets around these stars. And here you see that in the X, Y, uh, X, Z, and Z, Y plane. And you see in time how the Oort clouds sort of mingle in and mix and become all tidal tails. You see here the tidal tail of these stars are very elongated. And there's still some Oort cloud objects bound, but most of the objects are in these tidal tails. Until at an age of 1 billion years after the start of this simulation, you see they all congregate to the sun, which is about here. It's a little bit later than here, but you see this is the moment, of course, when all the stars are observed. That's today, when Gaia sees these stars. And I continue the calculation a little bit further for 100 million years to see where they are later. So some of the neighboring stars, which were neighboring, are later in time. They will be completely gone at the other side of the galaxy. But most of them will be still sticking around because they are together already. So the solar system is embedded into the Oort clouds of other stars. This is the picture where you see the stars themselves, which are the red dots. The big red dot in the middle is the sun. And uh, you see the green stuff here is the asteroids of the stars in the solar neighborhood. And here you see the blow up on the top right. This the Oort clouds of these stars. They have the Oort clouds on themselves, but the Oort clouds are overlapping. So we are not in a sort of a closed system with our own Oort cloud, but some of our Oort cloud actually are in the Oort clouds of neighboring stars. And some of the neighboring stars Oort cloud objects are inside our own Oort cloud. It's all a very messy environment. Now you can also look for all these stars. Some planets are also kicked out. So in some cases, these planets interact too, and they also kicked out each other. And this is how the planet distribution of all these stars put all together into same major X and eccentricity are distributed. And in red over plotted is the normalized density of their Oort clouds. And you see that some planets are expected to be in their Oort clouds. So you know, of course, there is a lot of discussion about planet nine. Well, I'm not necessarily a believer of planet nine. I would like to show, uh, see a picture of it. If they show me a photograph, I believe it's there, but um, for it is not unlikely that uh, an, a planet arrives in an Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud can also contain planets which also are kicked out by this conveyor belt of mechanism. Now, if you look at the neighboring stars, which one are the ones which are most promising of delivering asteroids inside the solar system? So can we see asteroids of, for example, Gliese 752? And uh, the number of Earth masses per cubic parsec uh, that Gliese 752 contributes at the location of the sun is about 1%. So that's quite substantial. It is, it is quite, quite a large uh, fraction and, and not even inconsistent or, or, or discrepant with the current estimates of the mass of the Oort cloud. So there is a sizable fraction of asteroids from Gliese 752 which may coincide with the solar system. Maybe we have one even in the solar neighborhood. You can look at the velocities. And if you look at the velocity as a function of distance of all the asteroids of all the other stars, they form these striped sort of things. And uh, Oumuamua and Borisov, the two uh, interstellar asteroids which were discovered, had both had a velocity of about 30 kilometers per second. So they're around, uh, they're, they're around this, this regime, exactly where it is the density plot. So it doesn't matter mean that that they are from any neighboring stars? Probably not. Probably they are older than that. But um, they have escaped earlier from their stars. And this is the picture of the interstellar asteroids around the sun at this moment, within the within a kiloparsec. The problem, of course, is that they're extremely hard to observe because you know they are comets. But if there is no star in the neighborhood, you will not see them because they are sort of you know ice balls which uh, do not uh, have nice tails like comets do. Now, if you look at uh, the sky position of Oumuamua, which was the first interstellar asteroid discovered, and Borisov, the second interstellar asteroid discovered, and overplotted here is the density distribution 
of neighboring star asteroid fields, so to say. So the tidal tails, the asteroid tidal tails of the neighboring stars. And you see that both Borisov clearly is far off from any of the neighboring stars, and Oumuamua, I would say, is also off. So they are not, they're not really belonging to any of the neighboring stars. They're probably older and from other stars, maybe farther away, which I didn't take into account in this calculation. So I would like to, to draw a few conclusions. The Oort cloud didn't form in a simple process, but it is really a sort of conspiracy of nature which caused the Oort cloud to form, where planets interact with asteroids and with the tidal fields. And if it's not all fit together nicely, you wouldn't get a very nice Oort cloud. So there are stars that even if they would potentially have formed an Oort cloud, they probably have not because the planets kicked the asteroids out too violently. And then they always become interstellar asteroids like Oumuamua. Our own Oort cloud evaporates on a time scale of about a few giga years. And what we have now in the Oort cloud is only a small fraction of the original Oort cloud. We had more objects in the Oort cloud originally, but those are in sort of a tidal tail around the solar system in the apex and antapex in the orbit of the sun around the galactic center. The material lost from the solar system stays in the orbit of the sun around the galactic center. These are the banana shaped uh, distributions of asteroids and who, well, who knows what is there. Um, um, the neighboring stars have their potentially their own Oort clouds, but these Oort clouds overlap and uh, in a big part. And uh, the sun is passing through the Oort clouds of other stars and the other way around. Um, and some stars will lose their Oort cloud completely when they have a rather elliptic galactic orbit. And that is, uh, that is, I think, all I would like to say about this. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Simon, for this very nice talk. I'm sure there must be some questions from audience. Uh, we have time for that. If there is any question, Yes, Ariel Pash. Uh, hi, Simon. This was this was fascinating. It was very interesting. Hi, Ali. Yes, yeah, good. Uh, good. I would say good to see you, but I I don't see you. But it's <laughs> it's good to have you here in Zoom. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, I see you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is about the contribution of all this stuff. Uh, sort of trailing out of the Oort clouds of individual stars on galactic structure. For example, could this have some kind of interaction with the, uh, with the galactic arms, with their formation or trigger, uh, or with the dark matter in the galaxy? I mean, obviously uh, it doesn't have like the uh, mass fraction that the total dark matter content would require, but uh, you know, all this stuff sort of streaming out of uh, stellar systems, what does it contribute, if anything, to the galactic structure? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that much. I mean, it's 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 really low mass stuff. The total mass in the Oort cloud is, uh, is, is, is way less than an Earth mass. And if each star has an Oort cloud, then the total mass in Oort clouds is the number of stars times something like a hundredth of an Earth mass. So the total mass is absolutely negligible. Um, the total number of objects is rather large. You can calculate that, and it amounts to something like uh, a mole of uh, asteroids, uh, 10, 10 to the 23 asteroids in the, in the whole galaxy, uh, which is also consistent with um, the visitor Oumuamua and seeing that. I think if you if you can see any structure in the in the Oort clouds or in the asteroids in the, the free floating asteroids so to say then it would be because where stars are born stars are born in clusters these clusters do the same thing they also fall apart but they also stay in streams yeah. um, so there are stellar streams in in the galactic disk and these Oort cloud objects are also in these streams so I think if there is any structure here then you will you will be able to do some galactic archaeology on the streams of asteroids and stars, but I don't think they are affected at all by the spiral arms, basically, or hardly. Not even, not even as seeding something, because what is disrupted out of uh, star formation in clusters is, in, in mass terms, uh, the more obvious candidate. I guess. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think okay. so. I think, and, and these objects are so hard to see anyway. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. We, we can't even see our own Oort cloud. Let's say the Oort cloud of another star. There is there is an interesting aspect though, which I which I didn't talk about, is that in the galactic center, uh, you see an, an X-ray flare every day, and these X-ray flares can be caused. They are consistent, at least in 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 temperature and and X-ray flux, with an asteroid falling on the galactic center, uh, in, on the black hole. And if you calculate uh, the rate uh, and, and what is necessary in Oort cloud objects or in asteroid objects around the galactic center, you also amount to something like 10 to the 14 per cubic parsec, quite consistent with the Oort cloud we have. So it, it sort of confirms in some sense that the whole galaxy must be brimming with this stuff. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there is there are some questions from uh, participants. Fazil Khan, you can ask your question. Hi, Simon. This is Fazil. Um, so, my question is related to uh, MUs. Um, so, basically, you know, it seems that it can tackle almost all sorts of astrophysical modeling uh, problems. Um, so I would like to know, you know, uh, in galaxy collisions or galaxy merger simulations, uh, these are again, multi-scale uh, simulations, even if we don't take gas into account, yeah, um, you know, the more or less the, in general, they are collision and less uh, sort of simulations that can solve things, but then there are, you know, galactic nuclei, which are collisional systems. So can we do in some sort of a hybrid thing where, you know, these collinal and collinal-less aspects can be taken care of, you know, uh, appropriately? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your question, Fazil. Yeah, I, th this is exactly one of the reasons to write uh, something like a muse, to, to combine the collisional and the collisionless dynamics together. Uh, and there are definitely ways to do this. This, in, in, in principle, what I showed here also is a combination of collisional and collisionless dynamics, where the collisional dynamics is the interaction of the asteroids with the planets. But the moment they arrive in the Oort cloud, this is a basically collisionless system. And if it's in the galactic potential, it's even even less collisional. Uh, so yes, it is uh, definitely possible to do calculations of galactic nuclei interacting together in their galaxy, even with gas, uh, and and study the merger or or study the black hole uh, final parsec problem or something. Okay, thank you. Uh I guess we have another question by Özgür Başkök. Hello, Simon. Great talk. Thank you very much. I think you can hear me clearly, right? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, it's interesting. So um, I'm an exoplanet person uh, and people are looking for planets uh, with the direct imaging, imaging technique pretty much where, uh, uh, where, the, uh, where the captured planets you have been talking about, right? So uh, do you have any suggestions for a diagnostic that a directly imaged planet is not, has not formed there or, um, or captured uh, by, uh, by, by the star somehow? Because people are having difficulty in explaining the formation of such, such planets, whether they are uh, formed by the core accretion me mechanism or they are formed by the disk instability. It seems that they could well be captured by a passing star, right? Um, though most of these systems are young and because uh, direct imaging people want uh, young planets because they are shining bright and it's easy to, to uh, take their images. Nevertheless, uh, there could well be planets, I think, captured uh, as you have explained. What are your comments on that? Yeah, thanks, Oscar, for a very, very interesting question. Um, this is this is definitely something I, I think about, and I, I think you're. I cannot imagine that. Uh, uh, I mean, stars do interact in their parent cluster. Uh, stars are born in clusters. Uh, planets are born around stars. And these stars and planets interact before the cluster evaporates. So there will be exchange of material um, 
and definitely of asteroids, but also of planets. And I think that many of the white planets you see, um, which are in orbits of maybe a thousand or maybe way further out AU, um, of which we don't even know the eccentricity of the orbits. Uh, but I do think that many of these very wide directly imaged planets uh, are captured objects. I don't think they are formed there. They may be kicked out, but that is relatively easy to, to study if you know the orbit of the planet. If there is a way to find the orbit of the planet, how eccentric is it? You can see basically on this image that if the planet is, is captured, you would expect it to be in relatively low eccentricity. And you have to you know, bear in mind that here 0 0.8 or 0 0.7 or 6, I call relatively low eccentricity. It's not part of the conveyor belt. But if the planet is part of the conveyor belt, or it is circularized so far out that it is circularized by the tidal field, then uh, I think you can have a planet that was kicked out by the parent star. So if you look at this picture, which I showed, uh, let me find it, this one. So these are planets on the right side. These are planets which are uh, kicked out from the inner planetary system simply by planet-planet scattering. But you see, there is nothing here. Well, there is one oddball here, but there is, there is basically, this is an empty region. So there is no way that the planetary system can kick out planets in this regime. So if you find an, a planet, uh, an exoplanet in this parking zone, then I think you can be pretty sure that it must have been captured. But if you find it in, for example, the Oort cloud or at very high eccentricity, it could also have been kicked out from the inside of the planetary system. Oh, all right. That's an interesting way to look at it because I thought always the uh, if the if the eccentricity is high, that could be captured. But you say if the eccentricity is as high as 0.8, even higher, then it could be uh, very probable that it was kicked out rather than captured. Yeah, I think so. I think the, the, the kicking out is easier than the capture. And dynamical simulations seem to show the places uh, where to look for the captured planets. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. That's You're welcome. Okay. It seems there is no question, and uh, we thank you for this very nice talk, and also we uh, thank uh, the audience for questions, for contributions. So this was our last talk of this series. So next year we are uh, planning to organize uh, these meetings again. So if you have any suggestion, you can send directly uh, to email us or so thanks. Bye. Yeah, thanks, you're welcome. Simon. Thanks for the invitation. And if you want to try AMUs, uh, you can download it from GitHub and uh, drop me a question if you have any. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.